Well, shalom and Shabbat shalom to those who are watching you know, this on a Shabbat. And I pray that everyone is having a wonderful, wonderful uh, day. Um, and I hope everyone has had a wonderful week. Uh, we are here at the Maxetic Study Group, um, co-hosted by Brennan Muchmore and myself, uh, Rafayahu. And what we are actually doing is um, we're actually doing a series right now, a series which uh, has to do with search, uh, search a matter out, right? So we want to search a matter out and find out uh, the roots of, you know, uh, certain, you know, topics that are uh, somewhat, you know, a little bit difficult to, to understand, or, or sometimes uh, there, there could be different doctrines that um, may have, you know, been influenced our way of interpreting certain scriptures. So we try to, so we're doing a series right now, but we're actually taking a break today from doing part of the series. We're actually going to, as we uh, go into Shavuot in the next couple of days, uh, Brandon put a wonderful uh, teaching together. That has to do with the uh, Shavuot and the harvest process. So there is a process in this harvest that we um, we see agriculturally as we are led to the mountain. Uh, so there is actually this this uh, particular process that um, leads to the Shavuot is, is an eight-day process of harvesting, and um, and it's a it's also a tie to a sanctification process that we actually go through uh, as Yahuwah refines us that, to that fine wheat from that roughness, right? So um, from the animal to the the, you know, the barley to the wheat. So, so we're very blessed by that. And I pray that uh, everyone will be also be blessed by this wonderful teaching and everyone who <clears throat> is um, in the, in this group right here. And I, I pray everyone will have a blessed, blessed Shavuot with you and your loved ones in the faith. All right. So, um, so Brandon, uh, whenever you're ready, um, um, go ahead, brother. The floor is yours. Perfect. Well, first of all, it sounds like somehow you got a copy of my notes already, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's how the Ruach works, right? Because we can say, you know, nope. I mean, all, all that you know is what the announcement said, you know, but you're right. That's exactly what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about sanctification, the process from barley nature to the wheat nature and everything like that. So Hallelujah. We're in tune with that. <laughs> so, all right, let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. Here we go. All right. So first, um, wait, which screen am I sharing? Hang on. What, did it show the document, Jose? Yes, it showed a, a Word document, and I believe there's a, yes. Uh, okay. We can and see it, that, yes. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, it yeah. like jumps around on me. Um, so let me tell you how this started. So I, I'm, I posted on Facebook right around this time last year, May the 20th, about uh, studying the book of Ruth. And, you know, is it possible that Ruth was betrothed or chosen by Boaz at Shavuot, because you know, uh, you know, did Boaz purchase the land slash field that she came with, thus selecting his bride at Shavuot, right? And you know, basically the 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 Ruth chapter two is where I got all that from. Okay, so that's where this started, um, and then with that there was a snippet from. There was a snippet from uh, this blog that I found on the book of Ruth. Um, and that's where that's where the, the uh, eight bullet points that I'm going to cover today came from. OK, that's where it came from. The idea uh, came from. And then, you know, it just uh, I was having a conversation the other day about um, the harvest process um, with uh, with a friend of mine. And I was like, oh, man, that, that sounds like that would be a really good uh, topic for a teaching. And so here we are. <laughs> so, um, all right. Okay. So, so the title of the message 
is Shavuot, the process of the harvest, or you could word it the harvest process, however you see fit. Okay. Now, Shavuot or Pentecost, as it's called in, uh, in Christianity, is the fourth biblical feast. It is the Aleph Tav, if you will, which I'll get to in a second, in the center of the menorah. It is called the Feast of Weeks. Be weeks. Is my mic on? I'm sorry. You guys can hear me, right? Yes, brother. Loud and clear. Okay. I just looked down. Sorry. Um, just want to make sure. Um, it's called the Feast of Weeks because we count ourselves seven Shabuah or weeks from the day that we brought the wave sheaf of the first fruits, according to Leviticus 23.15, which is why we're celebrating it uh, on Sunday when we're recording this on, uh, on Friday, May 27th. So Sunday, uh, May 29th will be Shavuot for us. Okay. What does it represent? It represents the Ruach HaKodesh. It represents the Holy Spirit which is the spirit of counsel. There are seven spirits of Yahuwah, uh, according to Isaiah 11, verse 2. And the fourth one is the spirit of counsel, which is interesting because, you know, he is, the, the Holy Spirit is our, our counsel, right? We, we get uh, information and, and guidance from the Holy Spirit, right? So here is the beginning of uh, Genesis or Bereshit. Go so reading from right to left because Hebrews from right to left. You'd have Bereshit. I don't know what that says, but <laughs> created uh, Elohim created it, the Aleph Tav is untranslatable. It says, but we know it's the Aleph Tav. It represents Yahuwah and Yahusha, uh, Aretz and the Shamaim. Right. So in the beginning, Yahuwah created Aleph Tav the heavens and the earth, or the earth and the heavens, right? And this is what I'm talking about, about Shavuot being the Aleph Tav, is because if you look at a menorah, which represents the seven spirits of Yahuwah, which represents the seven feasts of Yahuwah, and which represents this right here as well, this first, these first seven words or phrases of Bereshit, in the beginning, Yahuwah created Aleph Tav, the heavens and the earth. And the Aleph Tav is, you know, we just finished up a dovetailing series, and we talked about how the Aleph Tav is the ultimate dovetailer. And he is the one who, Yahusha is the one who ties together uh, the summer feasts, or you might know them as the spring feasts, and the winter feasts together. He, they're all about him, Right. So Shavuot is that fourth piece or that middle uh, pillar of the menorah. Now, as Brother Jose said, Shavuot is about the refinement process, which is what sanctification is all about. We have salvation and we have sanctification, right? Two, two different events. We have to work out, according to Philippians 2.12, we have to work out our own salvation with fear and with trembling. Okay. Now we've heard our brother Matthew uh, mention previously that Shavuot is about going from our carnal or fleshly nature of the barley harvest, which is what Passover is about, to the greater spiritual nature, which is what Shavuot is about and the wheat harvest. Okay. So barley nature, Passover, fleshly, carnal, animal food, wheat, spiritual, human food, right? Make sense? It's the great, greater and the lesser, okay? This is how we can offer up our bodies as the new grain offering of fine flour. But we're going to touch on exactly how we get from wheat harvested to the fine flour. Now, Revelation 6.6, 6, talking about the third seal or the third horse, horseman of the apocalypse, it shows us that wheat is more costly than barley is. And it is indeed more costly costly for us to make this transition from our carnal or fleshly nature to the new spiritual man or woman. Revelation 6.6 6 says, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wage 
and three quarts of barley for a day's wage and do not harm the oil and the wine. So like I said, wheat is more costly than barley. That's why you have wheat is a quart of wheat for a day's wage. And the same day's wage gets you three quarts of barley. It's easy to stay in our fleshly and our carnal nature, but it's a tough, costly process of dying to ourselves and crucifying our flesh and being crucified with, uh, with Mashiach, like Galatians 2.20 talks about, to daily do that, take up our, our cross and follow Messiah daily. And that's how we become that we nature. So our, our calling, your calling is costly. But an unsquashed olive has no purpose. Diamonds are created through intense pressure and heat. That's how diamonds are created. Without intense heat, gold, silver, and other precious metals could never be purified. So everything has to go through a process like this, right? So Shavuot is the harvest of the winter wheat. And Sukkot represents the harvest of the summer wheat. So you have two wheat harvests within a year. Now, these two feasts could very well represent the two harvests of the 144,000, that being the first fruits of Revelation that Revelation 7, 1 through 4 talks about, and the great multitude that Revelation 7, starting in verse 9, talks about. And we discussed that a couple of weeks ago regarding the second Passover. Now, let's talk about briefly uh, what Shavuot is and, and run through uh, some chapters or, or verses in Leviticus and uh, Deuteronomy. So it says, and from the morrow, after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count for yourselves, for yourselves, I want to emphasize, seven completed Sabbaths, or Shabuah. Until the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, you count 50 days. Now, remember, there were 50 loops on the curtain, across the curtain rod in the uh not in the temple, but in the uh, in the tabernacle, okay? I believe that it, those 50 loops were used to keep track because the priests uh, would keep track of the calendar, of what day they were on, when when the, uh, the, the tekufa or the equinox was and all that kind of stuff. They would be the ones keeping track of this for the entire uh, group, okay? Then you shall bring a new grain offering to Yahuwah. Bring from your dwellings a wave offering, two loaves of bread, and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour. They are baked with leaven, the first fruit, first fruits uh, to Yahuwah. Besides the bread, you should bring seven lambs, a year old, perfect ones, one young bull, two rams. They are a burnt offering to Yahuwah, and with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for sweet fragrance to Yahuwah. And you shall bring one male goat as a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a peace offering. And the priest shall wave them besides the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before Yahuwah. Besides the two lambs, they are set apart to Yahuwah for the priest. And on the same day, you shall proclaim a set apart gathering or a mikra kodesh, which means you, you don't do any work. Uh, you don't go buy and sell. Okay, It is a... Uh, 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 a Sabbath, it's not the weekly Sabbath, but it is a, a Sabbath along with being a feast. Uh, set apart gathering for yourselves. You do no servile work. A law forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, do not completely reap the corners of your field. When you reap, do not gather any gleaning from your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. In Deuteronomy 16, it gives us a little bit uh, more clue. It says, count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count seven weeks, Shabuah, Strong's H7620, from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. So the time that the harvest begins is when you begin to count, not at the end of the harvest. Uh, and you shall perform... The Feast of Weeks to Yahweh your Elohim, according to the voluntary offering from your hand, which you have, 
which you give as Yahuwah your Elohim blesses you. And you shall rejoice before Yahuwah your Elohim. You and your son and your daughter, your male servant, female servant, and the Levite who is within your gates, and the stranger, which means sojourner, right, or, or foreigner, or those who are uh, of the Gentiles who are grafted in, right? Uh, the fatherless and the widow who are in your midst at the place where Yahuwah El your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Mitzrayim or Egypt, and you shall guard and do these laws. All right. So the process of bringing in the harvest, so the process of the harvest in, you can call it really seven steps and then an eighth step, you're just rejoicing, right? But so we're going to talk about number one, cut. We're going to talk about cut. We're to be cut. We're to be bundled. Number two, we're to be taken to the, the threshing floor or transported to the threshing floor. When we're there, we're to be threshed. Number five, we're to be winnowed. Number six, we're to be sifted. Number seven, we're to be bagged. And if we make it all the way from one all the way to seven, then we shall indeed be rejoicing. All right, so let's get into this. So number one, the stocks of ripened grain, ripened, so we have to be ready to be harvested, right? Were cut with hand sickles and laid on the ground by men and women. Deuteronomy 16.9 says, count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. And it says, when you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you shall pluck the heads of your with your hand, but do not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. Now, it's interesting. What did Yahushua get accused of on Shabbat or on the Sabbath of when the disciples were walking through a field and they like plucked a couple of things of grain, right? That's why right there is because you're not supposed to uh, use a sickle on your neighbor's grain, but you can pluck with your hands so they did not break the torah uh it says jeremiah 50 uh verse 16 cut off the sower from babel and him who handles the sickle at time of heart the sickle at harvest time from the sword before the sword the oppressor each one turns to his own people each one flees to his own land joel 3 13 says put in the sickle for the harvest has grown ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is filled, the vats overflow, for their evil is great. Which there's two sickles in Revelation 14. One of them matches Joel 3, and the other uh, is, the, is the harvest you want to be in, right? And just some graphics here, just so you can look at something else besides the text. It says in Revelation 14, 14, and I looked and saw a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like the son of man, having on his head a golden crown in his hand, a sharp sickle. Another messenger came out of the dwelling place, crying with a loud voice to the one sitting on the cloud, send your sickle and reap, or other translations say thrust your sickle and reap, because the hour has come for you to reap, because the harvest of the earth is ripe and the one sitting on the crowd on the cloud thrust his sickle to the earth on the earth and the earth was reaped now uh john five uh john chapter four after yahushua speaks to the woman at the well and has that encounter as disciples come to him and he talks to them about i've already eaten and they thought like well who gave him food and he said you know, my food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. And then in verse 35, he says, do you not say there are still four months and the harvest comes? See, I say to you, lift up your eyes and see the fields, for they are white for harvest already. Because he was talking about the winter wheat. He who is sown, he is, who is reaping receives a reward and gathers fruit for everlasting life. So that both he who is sowing and he who is reaping rejoice together. For in this, the word is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Marita Sweeney. So join the meeting. 
you can see right here, this is a picture of the wheat, the winter wheat, as it's getting ready to be harvested there, right? Because we know that uh, wheat bows down when it's getting, when it's ready to be harvested. And then today, just today, I was, we were heading into town and I took this picture from the passenger seat of uh, the field already cut. So the winter wheat is being harvested right now, just in time for Shavuot out here in, in Texas. Now, the Hebrew word kermash is H2770, a sickle as in cutting. And the two occurrences there are Deuteronomy 16, 9, 23, 25. And then there's also Magal, and it means to reap and also a sickle. And that's used in Jeremiah 50, verse 16, and Joel 3, 13. Step two, after we're cut, which think about being cut, right? We're, you know, we were placed, Yahuwah or Yahusha talks about that. He talks about a parable of the kingdom as a field and that a man buys the field because there's buried treasure within the field. Or we could even say that because of the crops that were in the field, right? So the field is the world and we are planted in the midst of the field along with the tares who were planted, who were planted after us, which you can learn about the parable of the tear, wheat, the tares in Matthew 13, starting in verse 24. But we're being, we have to be cut, right? So what is the first step in the sanctification process? It's being cut deeply in the heart. We have a circumcision of the heart where we're cut out of, you know, sometimes for a lot of us, we were cut out of our, our fraternal families right? Like our, our, our actual earthly families, we were cut out of them, we we're plucked out of them, plucked out of the field, and removed from those areas, right? So we have to allow the cutting to happen first. Number two, then the cut stalks were then gathered into bundles and tied into sheaves. Um, and this was set up, then they were set up upright to prevent moisture from causing mold or mildew. And Genesis 37, seven, it says, see, we were binding sheaves. This is Joseph telling his dream about the sheaves to his brothers, right? We were binding sheaves in the midst of the field and see my sheaf rose up and, and also stood up and see your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf, which is a ref. This is a reference to, you know, Joseph is a reference to or a foreshadowing of Mashiach ben Joseph, which is Yahushua. And Philippians 2, uh, what is it, verse 9 and 10, it talks about every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Yahushua HaMashiach is master to the glory of Yah the Father, right? Um, Psalm 126, verse 6 says, he who goes on and, weep, and weeps, bearing seed for sowing, shall indeed come in with rejoicing, bearing his sheaves. Matthew 13 30 says, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I shall say to the reapers, first gather the darnel or the tares, which are poisonous, by the way, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But the wheat gather or but gather the wheat into my granary or into my storehouse. Now the ancient art depicts women and children involved in this activity as well. Uh, which we see that in Ruth chapter 2, verse 7 and 15. She said, please let me glean and gather among, gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. And she came and has remained from morning until now. She sat a little in the house. And she rose up to glean, and Boaz commanded his young men, saying, let her glean among, even among the sheaves. Do not embarrass her. And then we see in Psalm 129, verse 7, that shall not fill the reaper's hand, nor the sheaves fill the binder's bosom. And those who pass by shall not say, the blessing of Yahuwah be upon you. We have blessed you in the name of Yahuwah. 
Deuteronomy 16, 11 says, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, female servant, the Levite who is in your midst, in your gates, the stranger, like I said, the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow who are in your midst at the place where Yahuwah choose, your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell. The corners of the field and any stalks of the grain that happened to fall were left were to be left for the gleaners. The poor who were under the law had the right to gather the gleanings. So basically, the entire field would be cut. It would be harvested, right? They would bind everything up. But then, if they... You know, after they gathered everything and put it on the cart and wheeled it away, if they left a, a sheave or a bundle, they would leave it for the poor or the widow or the fatherless, the orphan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? According to Leviticus 19:9, it says, And when you reap the harvest of your land, do not completely reap the corners of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest, and do not uh, and do not glean your vineyard. Or gather every grape of your vineyard, leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am Yahuwah your Elohim. Leviticus 23, 22, it says, when you, And when you reap the harvest of your land, do not completely reap the corners of your field. When you reap, do not gather any gleaning from your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am Yahuwah your Elohim. Right? And here is where we get the context of what we're talking about. It gives further explanation Deuteronomy 24, 19 says, and have forgotten a sheaf in the field, do not go back to get it. So that's how we know what a gleaning is or what we're and what exactly we're talking about there. Okay. Now, uh, the word for sheaf is aluma or alum. Okay. And it's something bound, a sheaf, bundle. Well, isn't it interesting? So first we have to be cut. Right, we have to be cut out of the world. We have to be cut out of our family sometimes, right? And we have to be cut circumcision of the heart, right? Then, secondly, we're bound. Well, isn't it interesting that we're betrothed to our Messiah? We are bound to him in covenant by a covenant that we accepted because he said in the in Exodus 19. If you do this, then you shall be a uh, set apart and Kodesh nation to be a kingdom of priests and a Kodesh nation, right? And we said all that Yahuwah has said we will do. So we are bound to our Messiah, right? To our king, just like the sheaf. So we are bound through covenant. That's the second step, okay? The third step is then the bundled and dried sheaves were then transported or taken to the threshing site or the threshing floor. Now, this is a picture of a threshing floor right here, which would be outside of a city. It was a flattened area, uh, usually on a hilltop. We'll talk about why in a second. But you can see the different stages of the threshing. You actually have you know, the, the threshing taking place with the oxen and the sled, which I have a picture of the sled in a second. Um, you had the people unloading the grain or the, the, the sheaves onto there and spreading them out. You have people uh, winnowing them, which we'll talk about as well, and also people sifting them as well. Okay, we're going to talk about all this. So uh, the threshing floor, like I said, was an elevated flat area with a smooth surface usually on a hilltop where the afternoon winds would help the winnowing process. Now, remember that sight picture of the, of the winds, okay? Come back to that in a second. But Ruth 3.6 says, and she went down to the threshing floor and did all to, and uh, did according to all that her mother-in-law, uh, Naomi, instructed her. And Boaz ate and drank, and his heart was glad, and he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came softly and covered his feet and lie down. And then Amos 2, 13 says, See, I am weighed down by you as a wagon is weighed down when filled with sheaves. There you go. There's your wagon filled with sheaves. And then Micah 4, 12 says, But they do not know the thoughts of Yahuwah, nor do they understand his counsel. For he has gathered them 
like sheaves to the threshing floor. And then uh, this is a verse I didn't even think about until I started doing this and it came up in a memory yesterday. But 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 says, and we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellence of, of the power of the power might be of Elohim and not of us. Being hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, being perplexed, but not in despair, being persecuted, but not forsaken, being thrown down, but not destroyed. Now, some of you might remember the old school song, Trading My Sorrows by Daryl Evans. And he talks about pressed, but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. This is where he got the lyrics from is from second Corinthians chapter four, always bearing about in the body, in the body, the dying of the master Yahusha, that the life of Yahusha might also be manifested in our body. Now we talked before several times about the cycles of Yahuwah before, right? Uh, day to day, the day to day cycle, the Shabbat to Shabbat cycle, the feast to feast cycle, the year to year cycle, uh, especially within the tour portions. Ezekiel's wheel within a wheel within a wheel, rolling forward prophetically, as Paul calls it, from glory to glory, because we are constantly being refined. These cycles are a part of the refining process, which takes us from the barley nature for animal food, the, which is for animals, the beastly nature, to the wheat nature of the one new man in Messiah Yahusha, okay? So think about, you have this these stalks of grain, and one thing I noticed on this is that, so it's the ox driving the sled, right? Which the sled, we're gonna talk about that in a second, what it actually means, but in ancient Paleo Hebrew, or in the uh, pictographic Hebrew, the ox represents the olive. We know that the olive represents Yahuwah and Yahusha because they're both the olive top, as scripture says, all throughout scripture, right? So it's, it's the olive, it's the ox that's actually driving this process of the refining of us and allows, uh, is allowing us to be crushed in order to, for us to complete or be completed in the harvest process. Make sense? So, Gorin, Strong's H, 1637. Gorin, in the Hebrew, is a threshing floor, as made even. By analogy, any open area, barn, corn, or threshing floor, uh, void, or place. Now, it's at the threshing floor, which is where every valley, every humble person, Will be raised up or will be exalted, and every mountain, every prideful person will be laid low. Every high place will come down, every low place will be raised up, right? True equality and justice are implemented at the threshing floor. The threshing floor is the pressure and the crushing of our flesh that produces the pure oil that is needed for us in order for us to trim our lamps as the wise virgin spoken of in Matthew 25. Now, isn't it interesting that these two Strong's numbers are the exact same number? One's Hebrew, one's Greek. So you have Goran, H, uh, or Hebrew, uh, 1637, and then you have Elion, G, 1637. Olive, olive oil. So through the crushing process, at the threshing floor or at the, uh, the stone of crushing, which is what an olive would go through. Maybe we'll cover that in a different time. But that is how we produce that oil by allowing our flesh to be crushed, okay? Number four, at the threshing floor, then the grain was loosed from the straw and the chafe and the chafe chaff, sorry, by threshing. So then after we're at the threshing floor, now we get threshed. 
This is part of the process, which is usually accomplished by the ox treading on the stocks. We just talked about that, okay? Uh, or by using the wheels of carts, or by the oxen drawing wooden sleds, which notched rims, okay? Uh, and then also they, they throw it up in the air like this as well. Now, one thing that's interesting about Deuteronomy 25 is it says this. So it talks about in verse two, and it shall be if a wrongdoer is to be beaten, then that the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence with the number of blows according to his wrong. Forty blows gives him, gives him but no more lest he beat him with many more blows than these and your brother be degraded before your eyes. Then in verse four, it talks about do not muzzle an ox while it is threshing. And I thought about this. I'm like, okay, in the physical, it's talking about this situation. But also, isn't it talking about the threshing floor? Because if we're wrong, or not just the wrong, but the wrong will be taken there as well and, and beaten through this process of being, you know, if we're, if we're prideful, then obviously we're going to get a different treatment than if we're meek and humble, right? According to the number of blows, according the number of blows, according to what's wrong. And then it talks about do not muzzle an ox while it's threshing. Well, the ox, like I said, represents Yahuwah, the olive. And it's almost like, you know, do not, do not silence or try to silence Yahuwah while he's threshing. Like, Allow him to speak to you, allow him to give you counsel, allow him to teach you something while you're being threshed at the threshing floor. Make sense? So do not muzzle an ox while it is threshing. Um, and then the, the uh, threshing sled we talk about there. Grain is crushed, so one does not go on threshing it forever nor break it with his wagon wheel, nor crush it with his horsemen. Isaiah 41, 15 says, I sh see, I shall, make, I shall make you into a new threshing sled with sharp teeth. Let you thresh mountains, beat them small, and make hills like chaff. And then you see uh, the burden against Damascus, which is from Isaiah 17, is right here as well. Amos 1, 3, thus said Yahweh, for the transgression, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I do not turn back, turn it back, because they threshed Gilead with threshing implements of iron. And then 1 Corinthians 9, 9, Paul actually references Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, for it has been written in the Torah of Moshe, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it about oxen Elohim is concerned? So thresh, the Hebrew word for thresh is douche or dosh, dosh or douche, okay? To trample or thresh, break, tear, thresh, tread out, tread down, okay? At, uh, at the grass. Okay. Um, the other word is for uh, the sled itself as kavrutz, kavrutz. Okay. Incised or incisive, a trench, gold is mine, threshing sled, having sharp teeth. Like I said, I'll show you that in a second. Uh, eager decision, right? We have, it, it's a decision. Choose this day whom you will serve. It's diligent, fine gold is in refinement, pointed things sharp, a thrusting instrument, a wall of separation. Now, this word for the threshing sled, which this is a threshing sled right here, okay? This word in the Latin tells us a lot though. It's tribula in Latin, this word. And it it's a broad, heavy board with many sharp teeth of stone or iron. The tribulum is still used in probably not just Northern Africa, but many other countries today out in the third world countries. But you can see the tribulum, it's a big board and it has holes drilled into it and there's stones put into it because all the rocks that would be on the threshing floor, it was used to literally break 
It has to break the grain out of the stalk, out of the chaff, right? It has to do that. Now think about this with regards to the tribulation, okay? Jacob's trouble, all right? Think about this. When we look at these, uh, the, the beasts here, okay? Daniel 7, 7 says, After this, I looked in the night visions and saw a forest beast, fearsome, burly, exceedingly strong, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured, crushed, and trampled down or threshed the rest with its feet. And it was different from all the other beasts, all the, all the beasts that were before it, and it had 10 horns. Verse 19, then I desired for certainty concerning the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, very fearsome with its iron teeth, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, crushed, and trampled down, uh, down the rest with its feet. Verse 23, this is what he said. Obviously, he's talking about uh, Michael who is given in the interpretation, the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom on the earth, which is different from all other kingdoms. And it devours all, all the earth and tramples it down and crushes it. But we have to remember that through the tribulation, Yahuwah, Yahusha, is holding the scroll. He's the one breaking the seven seals. He's the one allowing the new world order to implement the things that they want to implement right he's the one that takes us to the threshing floor through the tribulum through the tribulation which is where the word comes from we the grain have to be released from the rest of the stock the chaff and our grass roots our roots have to be we have to be pulled out of our roots so that we can be released into our purpose, which is to finish the race and be brought into his storehouse and bagged, right? If we hang on to our roots, if we remain in that chaff, we get blown away. We will still be with the useless stocks, the chaff, which get tossed into the fire, and we must let go in order to come into his storehouse. Hence, why we have to come out of her, my people, right? Step number five, winnowing. Matthew 3.12 says his winnowing fork is in his hand. So at this point of the process of winnowing began, the grain would be tossed into the air with the winnowing forks. Isaiah 30.24 says the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground eat seasoned foddered widowed winnowed with shovel and fan uh, jeremiah 15 verse 7 and i shall winnow them with a winnowing fan in the gates of the land and i shall bereave i shall destroy my people that they would not they would not turn back from their ways his winnowing Matthew 3, 12, again, his winnowing fork is in his hand. He shall thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. He shall thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. Now, this part right here, part A, uh, hopefully the wind cooperated by blowing away the chaff while the heavier grain fell to the ground. But in the absence of wind, the winnowing, wind, the winnowing fans were used to create a breeze. Psalm 1, verse 4 says, The wrong are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Now, interesting, and I think I brought this up a couple of weeks ago as well, but I wanted to bring up these four winds again in Daniel and also in Revelation 7. Daniel 7, 2 says, Daniel spoke and said, I was looking in, I was looking in my vision by night and saw four winds of the heavens stirring up the great sea. Revelation 7 verse 1 says, After this I saw four messengers standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another messenger coming up from the rising of the sun, holding the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four messengers to whom it was given to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim upon their foreheads. 
So again, when these winds of tribulation continue to blow, that is what continues to separate the grain from the chaff. It just gets blown away and eventually burned in the fire. Now, uh, the word here uh, for winnow is a zara, zara, okay? To toss about, by implication, diffuse, winnow, cast away, compass, disperse, fan, scatter, spread, through, winnow. Now, like the wheat, at times, our world's, our world gets agitated, the world that we, we live in, right? The, the, our lives that we live in. We get agitated. We get tossed about. We, we even get flipped upside down rapidly. But we are to remain rooted and grounded in the love of Messiah, Ephesians 3, 14 through 19 there for reference, and not to be tossed about by every wind and wave of doctrine, Ephesians 4, Verse 11 through 16 talks about. And I can tell you that, you know, my experience with, uh, with losing my two daughters, you know, now over two years ago, uh, over uh, this, this whole uh, pandemic, I can tell you that I rapidly got tossed up in the air. And it was a decision of, hey, do I... Am I weighed down by his, his glory, his presence inside of me? Is there something, is there an anchor holding me down? Or am I just going to be blown to the wayside, right? And that's what this process of, of sanctification and tribulation really, truly does. Number six, sifting. Have you ever sifted something before? I have. Um the grain was then gathered and sifted. Amos 9.9, 9. we'll get to that in a second, to remove any foreign debris like stones, dirt particles, or even manure, okay? Amos 9.9 9 says, for look, I'm commanding, I shall sift the house of Israel among all the Gentiles, among all the nations, as one sifts with a sieve, Yet not a grain falls to the ground. So he's going to shake, he's going to sift the whole nations, all the nations, for the house of Israel. Because he's seeking for the lost sheep or the house of Israel to bring them into the harvest. Now, one thing that I found in my studies is... Going back to the Aleph Tav is right here in this verse. If you go and look in the Hebrew in the KJV plus here in Amos 9, 9, it says, I will sift Aleph Tav. That's what the H uh, 853 is, the house of Israel. So I, I will sift the Aleph Tav, the house of Israel. So he's letting us know who's doing it. Okay. Letting us know who's doing it. Um, and the word for sift is H5128, nuwa, nuwa, to waver in great variety of applications, literally or figuratively, as subjoined continually, uh, to make go up and down, to be gone away, to be movable, be promoted, real, remove, scatter, set, shake, sift, stagger, to and fro, be a vagabond, wag, make wonder, up and down. And then if we look at uh, Hebrew, Haggai, rather, 2.6, uh, it says, I will shake all of Tav, the heavens and the earth, right? Haggai chapter 2, verse 6, for thus said Yahuwah Savot, or Yahuwah of hosts, once more in a little while, I am shaking the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake, I shall shake the nations, all nations. They shall come to the delight of all nations all the nations, and I shall fill this house with glory, with esteem, said Yahuwah Savot. Isaiah 24, starting in verse 19, literally tells you the soon fate of the earth. It says, the earth shall be utterly broken. The earth shall be completely shattered. The earth shall be fiercely shaken. The earth shall stagger like a drunkard. It shall totter like a hut, and it's transgressed 
transgression shall be heavy upon it. It shall fall and not rise again. And in that day, it shall be that Yahuwah punishes on high the host of the exalted ones and on the earth, the kings of the earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in a pit and it shall be shut up in prison, in the prison and be punished after many days. And the moon shall blush and the sun shall be ashamed for Yahuwah Savot shall reign on Mount Zion and in Yerushalayim before his elders and in esteem. Now here's what's interesting is there's two harvests taking place. There's two harvests taking place. Okay. There's the harvest of Yahuwah and there's the harvest of Satan. And here in Luke 22 Verse 31, we see what we're talking about. And the master said, you know, Yahushua said, Shimon, Shimon, see, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your belief should not fail. So we have an intercessor who stands on our behalf and prays for us. And when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. So Satan is sifting. He's sifting the nations right now. Because, see, here's the deal. You're either Yahuwah's wheat or you're Satan's wheat. Because Yahuwah's wheat is Satan's, or is Satan's chaff, and Yahuwah's chaff is Satan's wheat, if you get what I'm saying, right? We have to choose this day who we will serve. And then... Second to last year, the, the clean grain after it was sieved or after it was sifted was then bagged and transported either for storage in a silo or to the market for sale. And there's some uh, bags of clean grain. And going back to Joseph and the famine, Genesis 41, verse 35, it says, And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the hand of of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities and the food shall be for a store for a store for the land for the seven years of the scarcity of food which shall be in the land of Mitzrayim and do not let the land be cut off by the scarcity of food and in the seven years of plenty the ground brought forth generously he gathered up he gathered all the food for seven years which were in the land of Mitzrayim laid up the food in the cities he laid up in every city, the food of the fields which surrounded them. Thus, Yosef gathered very much rain as the sand of the sea. Now, where have we heard the sand of the sea before? Genesis 12, when Abraham is promised that his descendants will be as the stars in the heaven and the sand of the sea until he ceased counting, for it was without number again a reference to the great multitude of Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. Because again, Joseph, the brother Joseph, represents Mashiach ben Joseph in Yahusha, right? Now, this, so what is threshing, right? How do we get, this is chaff, this is the grain. So through all these processes that we've talked about, they get that grain knocked out of the stalk or knocked out of that chafe, okay? And number eight, it says the chafe was burned in bonfires in the community celebrated with singing, dancing, and feasting. Ruth chapter three, going back to Ruth again, and Boaz ate and drank and his heart was glad and he went down at the end of the heap of grain and she came softly and uncovered his feet and lie down. Isaiah 524 says, therefore, as a tongue of fire devours the stubble, the flame consumes the chafe. Their root is as rottenness and their bosom goes up like dust because they have rejected the Torah of Yahuwah of hosts despise the word of the set apart one of Israel. And then a verse on rejoicing, Isaiah 9, 2, the people who are walking in darkness have seen a great light upon those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death. A light has shown. You shall increase the nation. You shall make its joy great. They shall rejoice before you as in the joy of harvest. 
as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. And going back to Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand. He shall thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the storehouse, but the chaff he shall burn with unquenchable fire. And it says the same thing as a second witness here in Luke 3.17. And lastly, uh, Matthew 15, verse 13 says, but he answering said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted shall be uprooted. Now, a couple of uh, Hebrew words for chaff here, chaff is kashash, kashash. And these are used in Isaiah 5.24 and Isaiah 33, verse 11. Now notice it says dry grass. So without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is what Shabbat is all about, to keep us moist, to keep us weighed down, we become dry, brittle, cracked, and we just blow away in the wind, right? It says a stock of grain from which the kernels have been beaten out. Beaten. Okay. Straw broken up by a threshing machine, right? Uh, moats is another word here, as pressed out or that is winnowed or threshed loose, okay? Uh, another here, this is the Greek, uh, achuron or akuron, okay? To shed forth as chaff. And that's the words that uh, are used in Matthew 3.12 and Luke 3.17 as well. So number one, first, to get harvested are the tares before the wheat, right? Matthew 13, 24 through 30. Then the wheat gets harvested and processed both physically and spiritually through these eight steps. So just to refresh here. Number one, we're harvested, we're cut. We're cut out from the world through the circumcision of the heart. We're set apart. Be holy as I am holy. We, we made a, a, a vow to him. We are bundled. We are bound to him. Betrothed. We are abiding in him. John 15. Number three, we're taken to the threshing floor where we're crushed, pressed and crushed by the ox who is the Aleph Tav. And we are threshed. Our fleshly nature is beaten out of us. Winnowed. Next, we are tossed up in the air, allowed to wander astray like chaff to see if we will be weighty and fall to the ground and be completed, uh, be a part of the completion of the harvest. Lastly, we are sifted, we are shaken, we are tested, we are purified. All the debris is removed. This is the part where we are chastened, right? Whom Yahweh loveth, he chasteneth. And, of course, you know, the, the bride has to be chastened. She has to be made ready. Lastly, we're bagged, gathered together, and brought into his storehouse. And number eight, we rejoice. A prepared bride for her bridegroom. Revelation 19, starting in verse 1, says, And after this I heard a loud voice of the great crowd in the heaven, or the great multitude, saying, Hallelujah, deliverance and esteem and respect and power to Yahuwah our Elohim, because true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her harlotry, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And a second time they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped him. They worshiped Elohim who sat on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. And a voice from the throne saying, praise our Elohim, all you servants and those who fear him, both small and great. Verse six, and I heard a loud voice of the great crowd as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for Yahuwah El Shaddai reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, his bride, has prepared herself. And to her it was given to be dressed in fine linen, chastised, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of 
the set apart ones. And he said, right, blessed is, are those who have been called to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of Elohim. Now, a couple of thoughts I had on the threshing. Grain has to go through this process of threshing. Has to go through this process of threshing. It's the only way to get the grain out of the stock, out of the chaff, is to go through the threshing floor. Is to go through this right here, or the threshing machine. So what if, what if we never go through, we're, we, what if we were to never go through tribulation? What if we were never to go through trials and tribulations and we're never separated from that chaff so we blow away as the chaff does because we wouldn't allow ourselves to be crushed? Hmm. Sobering thought. Right? Because there's people who want to escape tribulation. But one thing I'll, I'll say uh, real quick as we get to the end, James chapter 1 says this. James chapter 1 says this. Verse 2, my brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the proving of your belief or faith works endurance and let endurance have a perfect work so that you be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. And then Romans chapter eight says this. It says, Starting in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Messiah? Shall pressure or distress or persecution or scarcity of food, famine, or nakedness or danger or sword, war? As it has been written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are reckoned as sheep of the slaughter. But in this we are more than overcomers. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor messengers, nor principalities, nor powers, neither the present, nor the future, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Elohim, which is in Messiah, Yahusha, our master. Hallelujah. Now, just remember in closing, just because we are harvested, just because we are cut down, does not mean that we will make it all the way through the process. We have to go through each and every process because as Babylon is burned up, as the tares and as the chaff blown away, let all of Yerushalayim in heaven, the Shamayim, rejoice. And Shavuot is truly a time of separation where the bride is chosen and where the bride renews her vows of the covenant from Exodus 19 to her bridegroom. And in closing, as always, may Yahuwah bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you, lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace and shalom. Very good. Very good, brother. Um, really enjoyed uh, your teaching. Um, wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, so many, so much there. There's so much to, to chew on. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the, um, the last process. Uh, it really resonated with me because it talks about rejoice, right? And um, <clears throat> if you were to do a um, you know, study uh, about the feasts, um, about the, you know, the seven feasts, there's only two feasts that um, where the rejoice or being joyful as part of the commandment is actually only done in two feasts. And Shavuot is one of them. The other one is Sukkot. So re, being, when, when you rejoice, okay, it's only, com, it's only connected with two. And that is, the, um, that is the engagement or the betrothal that leads to the wedding feast. So it's, a very, it's all connected. 
because these two feasts are so connected because it is another process. I mean, first Passover, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 um, the upright, uh, like Joseph, Yahusha, the upright shaft while everybody else is bowing down, right? So that's, that's what we're, we're being grinded. So we, we become more in the, his image, more upright by the time of Shavuot. Well, we're ready, okay, to now, uh, you know, for the proposal. And then there's a wedding that, uh, that is, uh, you know, basically leads to that. So there's, it, that process just keeps going, which is uh, wonderful. Uh, it doesn't just stop at Shavuot. Um, but yeah, thank you, brother, for that. That was quite the, uh, the teaching, lots of uh, wonderful information regarding that. And, uh, you know, I can't help going, I was looking at the, uh, the Matthew 3, 12, when it says he's winnowing fork in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather his wheat into the mm -hmm. barn. But the shaft with unquenchable fire, I mean, there's also, uh, you know, on the context of it, is talking about you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit with fire. So he's burning all the stuff around you, you know, all the, all the, uh, whether it's idolatry, whatever, you know, just like the idols were had to get burnt. So he is making, he's purifying you. There's a purification process that actually allows uh, the wheat, uh, the good part to come out and to stay uh, pure and set apart because Yahushua, it's all about division between good and evil. I mean, he doesn't want to see the mixture. He wants to separate it. He wants us to be able to discern what's good and what's bad. So we can rightly choose. Well, there is no and, mixture, right? There I is mean, no, exactly. There, if you stay in the in that stock, you're not getting harvested completely. You're yeah. you're you're blowing away with the with that stock. So, uh, yeah, it was a real a real eye opener. Um, Wonderful you know, for me, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And for Israel, I mean, I love it because uh, he said for Shulak, I in Amos nine nine, I love it because. He said, uh, not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. So once you are chosen, you're called by him and you are then selected to be, uh, you know, as um, part of his harvest and part of his. I mean, that's it. He, he will not allow you to fall and um, to the ground. So that is for the house of Israel and, uh, and Judah, of course, uh, will eventually be one 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 stick. But that's it. I mean, it's wonderful that that promise uh, pertains to us and uh, as he gathers us with his hand, the, the harvest and the wheat. So yeah, we are in his hands and I do appreciate um, a wonderful teaching as we enjoy this uh, feast coming up. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and um, take hands and question comments. And uh, so we're so blessings to all of you that have been watching. And please, if you're not joining us uh, live, uh, please do so uh, because it really uh, the conversations, questions, and answer and discussions get really interesting. So for those who are not part of the live discussion, please join uh, towards the tribes.com forward slash connect, and you'll be able to uh, partake in, in the uh, discussions after the teachings. Okay, yes. so it gets very interesting. So you're missing out if you're not here with us. So I, I pray that um, you will consider it. And yeah, we'll lead you over here. All right. Oh, well, man. blessings.